much as him and his retribution, is the almost cult-like following he has over his most diehard supporters. Um, the, the, the threats, the harassment, the death threats that you get when he targets you and he's deliberate in targeting um, is, is, is really horrifying and has no place in our American discourse. And it's unlike anything I've seen in the decades plus I've been in politics. Our singular focus needs to be, if he is the nominee, on making sure that he is not elected the president again next November. Even if that means electing a Democrat. It's really disappointing because I look at these options and I'm upset with them, but at the end of the day, I trust one person with our government and democracy than I do the other. And so I've never voted for a Democrat in my life, but I think that in this next election, um, I would put policy aside and choose democracy. Former Trump White House aide speaking out on the dangers of a potential second Trump term. The Supreme Court is poised to rule on one of the most consequential ballot cases in American history. At least two states now have ruled former President Trump is not eligible to hold the office of the presidency. The Colorado case has already been appealed. If the Supreme Court agrees to hear the case, the New York Times writes, justices will act in the shadow of two competing political realities. The Times reports. They will be reluctant to wrest from voters the power to assess Mr. Trump's conduct, particularly given the certain backlash that would bring. Yet they will also be wary of giving Mr. Trump the electoral boost of an unqualified victory in the nation's highest court. Chief Justice John Roberts will doubtless seek consensus or at least try to avoid a partisan split of the six Republican appointees against the three Democratic ones. Joining us now, the author of that piece, Supreme Court reporter for The New York Times, Adam Liptak. Also with us for the conversation, former U.S. attorney and MSNBC legal analyst, Joyce Vance. Adam, um, in your reporting, what is the question before the courts here? Because uh, while in some of your analysis, there's a concern about looking partisan or tipping the scales, isn't the question about engaging in insurrection whether or not he did? The question for the court is a legal question, and that question is whether the 14th Amendment to the Constitution adopted after the Civil War bars people who have first taken an oath to support the Constitution and then engaged in an insurrection. And lots of people think the case against Donald Trump is airtight, that he did both of those things. Right. But there are a lot of sub-issues and uh, threshold issues that may be attractive to the court if it takes the case. It hasn't taken the case yet, but the Colorado uh, Republican Party has already asked the court to take the case and act really fast before the Super Tuesday primary. Uh, so it's, it's quite likely the court engages. Yeah, Joyce, I want to ask wow. you in a second about how quickly the Supreme Court needs to take this up, how quickly it, it will. But let's talk about its job in this case. Is it not the job of the Supreme Court here to interpret the Constitution without concern for the political backlash or the questions that might arise for the country, which are all noteworthy and things we should probably be concerned about. But in terms of the justices on that court, are they not just looking at whether this is constitutional? That's the job. And as Adam points out, the issue in front of them is the pure legal issue of Trump's eligibility. The court isn't supposed to take into account any political considerations. But I think Adam's dead on the money when he talks about there being a lot of potential procedural off ramps that the court could take that would permit Trump to remain on the ballot. And I think in this situation, it's difficult to believe that they'll completely divorce themselves from the policy considerations. A lot of people are concerned about removing the choice from the hands of voters. But if we look at it strictly as a legal matter, there are certain eligibility criteria to be president. You have to be 35. You have to be a native born citizen. Those sorts of criteria are a little bit more black and white than this question of whether or not Trump engaged in insurrection. So that, I suspect, is the area that the court will focus on if they want to avoid disqualifying him based on the 14th Amendment. And Joyce, what about the speed? Some of these ballots are to be printed in a matter of days, actually. So how quickly can we expect the Supreme Court to move here? Right. So the Supreme Court could go ahead and accept the case based on the existing petition, 
they might decide that they want to wait for um, the former president to actually file the notice of appeal. Here, here's the bottom line, though. If Trump does not appeal this ruling and the court doesn't hear the appeal from the Colorado Republican Party, then he will not be on the ballot in that state. Maybe that's something he believes is survivable, but with so many other states in, in play, Maine is only one of them. There are another of other states looking at this. I think the court will have to go ahead and take up the issue. And with at least Maine and Colorado part of the Super Tuesday primary group, they need to do it quickly. Adam, mm -hmm. uh, draw upon your experience covering the highest court to put this in some context for us. Seems like the most important election-based case since Gore v. Bush in 2000, frankly, one of the most important cases that it may ever take. Uh, and, and beyond that, tell us the role of what you, how you see Chief Justice Roberts approaching this and what sort of strategy or consensus building he might try to use. Well, the court, as you know, is embattled. It's going through a rough period. Uh, its public approval ratings are down. It's uh, been the subject of ethics scandals. And this is not a case the Chief Justice is eager to have. But it's probably unavoidable. This question needs a national solution. And his impulse is going to be to try to avoid doing damage to the legitimacy of the court, which a 6-3 Republican-Democrat uh, split of the appointees on the court would give rise to. So I think he would look for consensus. He would look for something incremental. He would look for something technical. And there are, as we've been discussing, off-ramps. There are ideas that... Congress has to act first or that it's a political question. Uh, so I think the Chief Justice will, will want to find a way not to give Trump a victory here, but to tell the American public that it's not, the court is not taking a position on the question of whether he engaged in an insurrection, but probably look for some technical way to rule for Trump, but not in a kind of earth-shattering way. This is not a court that's been particularly sympathetic to Donald Trump. It's a conservative court, but it has rebuffed Trump and his allies when they tried to get the court to overturn the election. And when the Manhattan DA and a congressional committee sought records from him, uh, the court voted seven to two against Trump with all of the Trump right. appointees in the majority and only Justices Thomas and Alito in dissent. Yeah, no, uh, there is some reporting that uh, former President Trump is very worried about this. Um, and Joyce, it's very hard to count how many different legal battles this former president is fighting at the same time. In this case, uh, are Colorado and Maine the only states that are doing something like this? You know, they're not, Mika. Other states have ruled that Trump does get to remain on the ballot. The Minnesota Supreme Court has taken that position, and there are proceedings in a whole host of states. This is complicated because we don't have one national election. We've got 50 different state elections with different mm -hmm. rules. So, for instance, in Colorado, Trump has to establish he's eligible to run, and that drove some of that ruling. In Michigan, um, uh, where the law is a little bit different, the, the courts have held that Trump is eligible to remain on the ballots, at least for the primaries. So all of this complexity adds up to Adam's point that the Supreme Court really will have to decide this issue. We can't have a patchwork quilt of 50 different states with 50 different rules when it comes to a presidential election. MSNBC legal analyst Joyce Vance, uh, one of the co-hosts of the Sisters in Law podcast. Thank you very much. Supreme Court reporter for The New York Times, Adam Liptak. Thank you for your reporting this morning. We appreciate it.